Okay, good afternoon everybody. Thanks very much for coming along to, to the seminar. Um, so we've got today, um, uh, Rob Patson's giving our talk. Of course, all of you or most of you should know Rob. Uh, Rob's been with us now for... Um, six years. Six years, six mm. years. Um, but uh, Dr. Rob Patterson did his uh, uh, master BSc degree at um, University of um, uh, University of Canada, Queen's University, Canada, uh, and he finished, which he finished in 2001. And then he went on to um, uh, do a master's at the University of Alberta, um, and then moved on to the University of British Columbia. I think he's making an attempt to go to all the universities in, in Canada. <laughs> uh, but he decided to change and uh, moved to. UNSW in 2007, I think, wasn't it? Year 8. 2008. It's 2008, 2008. Where yes. he started his PhD working on the hot carrier cells and actually pioneered the work on uh, modelling of phonon energies in, in nanostructures. Uh, and that work has gone on to develop in quite a few other areas. Uh, but the, for the last three years, since his PhD, finishing his PhD, Rob's been working in several other areas, which he's going to be telling us about today, I think, mm -hmm. but quite diverse areas, many different um, aspects, including uh, we, we're usually interested about reducing carbon dioxide emissions, but wor Rob's working on lots of ways to actually have net negative carbon dioxide emissions, and we're going to hear something about that as well. Definitely, so yeah. it'll be very interesting. So, um, but quite a change, I think. You've done, covered a wide, wide range of areas. You're working on thermoelectrics and... Um, um, superconductivity, I think, weren't you, in your master's area? I think, uh, related related to uh, topic. So a big range of areas. I don't think he's talking about that today, but um, we're going to ha have a very interesting seminar, I think. So okay. thank you, Rob. Thank you very much, Gavin. And thank you all for coming today um, to the seminar. Yes, as Gavin mentioned, I've been working in a number of different areas, and I, I basically wanted to be able to uh, stand up in front of you guys today and give an update on, on what's been done. So that's basically how the, stru uh, the, the talk is structured. And here's some of the activities that I've gotten myself into. I seem to pathologically like to spread myself as thin as possible. So um, we, we're working on colloidal quantum dot solar cells. This is one of the main topics that I'll start with. Uh, solution process of materials in general is something that we, uh, we do because for making materials here at UNSW, solution processing is, is a growing area, not just here, but also in solar in general, as we maybe all are all aware. Done some modeling as well in the past, as Gavin mentioned. Uh, hot care dynamics experiments as well. For um, we've been to the synchrotron in Japan using the IXS beam line to investigate phonon modes. Won't talk too much about that today. All optical hot carrier solar cells is also something that's going on with uh, some of the students here. Photoelectrochemical cells with uh, this, uh, a member of the audience. It's kind enough to show up. And then uh, bioenergy as well, net negative carbon energy systems, and also second generation air batteries and fuel cells using uh, sugar derived directly from cellulose. So these are all the things that, that I've been working on. These are ongoing projects. But just for today, I'm going to talk about these things. Colloidal quantum dot solar cells, catechol modified TO2, net negative carbon bioenergy systems where we put carbon in the ground while we make power. So this is kind of turning this fossil fuel paradigm right on its head. And antimony sulfoiodide and related compounds as highly polarizable materials with potential for high screening. So colloidal quantum dot solar cells, we're lucky enough to be funded for this. We have an AARC DP, which started in 2014. We're about a halfway through that project now. And it's on colloidal quantum dot solar cells. And just so that everyone knows, this it has made the uh, famous NREL chart, this cell type now currently boasts uh, an efficiency of about 9.9% from quantum confined material. So this is a significant accomplishment considering the amount of surface that needs to be passivated. The people that we follow are uh, Edward Sargent at UNSW, uh, sorry, at, at University of Toronto, and John Tong, who used to be at Toronto and is now in Wuhan. People at NREL are working in this area in, in Los Alamos. The Bowendi Group at MIT also is doing excellent work. They've been working in this field for a very, very long time. So solution processable materials. Many people know why you might want to uh, investigate these materials. They have potential for low processing temperatures and therefore low embodied energy and inexpensive raw materials. Another benefit is that the uh, footprint for these materials in a space-constrained university is rather small. So you can get away with uh, with having a smaller uh, lab space and still making uh, an interesting material uh, research-wise. 
and uh, that's something that that we are, are very excited about with new lab space coming available in the in the TTB, and also um, there's one more thing I want to say about that, but I'll pass it by. The novel quantum confinement effects are the things that we tend to. Uh, exploit in these materials. So again, as we make nanoparticles smaller and smaller, the band gap gets wider and wider. And for this, we tend to enjoy uh, using materials that have um, large atoms in them, heavy atoms. Oh, we have problems with material lifetime in, in this uh, uh, cell type, and mainly because we have large surface areas, as I mentioned. So uh, passivation is key, and the major efforts that have gone in in the past three or five years have gone in on uh, passivation. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. So again, because we tend to do uh, solution processing, we have access to a wide variety of materials. If you go into a chem lab and you have a shelf full of chemicals, you can almost have the whole periodic table there available to you. And if you're a good chemist, then uh, you have some uh, opportunity to make interesting materials in a piece of glassware, which is a, a nice advantage. We tend to stick to lead uh, calcogenides so far, sulfides and selenides, but we also use some other typical materials for these, uh, this type of cells, zinc oxide, titania, and we have silica. Here's a picture of some silica nanoparticles which have been made for plasmonics applications. But we also have other uh, potential for other materials as well. MOS2 is a potentially interesting material. ZNS is a potentially interesting material, all of which can be made um, in a beaker and uh, as nanoparticles. So something for a general audience, again, is that I find actually quite miraculous about this, uh, these materials is that if you mix up your chemicals right in a 3 neck flask like this, you can actually create uh, particles that have very, very uh, strict tolerances on their size and shape. So these are essentially spherical um, nanoparticles and all of them have a, a size which is within a few nanometers of each other. So this is, and there are billions of them. <laughs> so this kind of uh, uniformity from a solution processing approach is, uh, is just kind of interesting to me. And what you end up with is nanoparticles that have uh, surface ligands and these ligands look something like this, long chain hydrocarbons typically. And with the hydrophilic end stuck to the nanoparticle and the hydrophobic end dangling out in space here. So we like materials again that have large atoms in them because they have potential for large Bohr radii and, and uh, large confinement effects. So we can really expand the, the band gap using these uh, materials with big atoms in them. And here's a dark field TEM which is taken at University of Wollongong made by uh, Lin Yuan who's here today with us. Bromine terminated uh, lead sulfide. And this is wonderful TEM shot. I just, I think it's so beautiful. I had to show it to you this. Look at the fringes. You can really see the atoms in this. So that's uh, a really nice shot. Here's the cell structure that we typically use. It's a typical um, cell structure also employed for uh, organic solar cells and things like this. So yeah, glass, TiO2, FTO, and then we have our lead sulfide and lead selenide quantum confined material on top. And here are some of the band offsets which show you basically which materials are N-type and which materials are P-type. Okay, so here's something a little bit more interesting. So as we know, in general, solution process materials have problems with their stability. So, and quantum dot solar cells are no exception. So what has recently been discovered is if we cap these materials with halide atoms, then we can slow or stop the, uh, the oxidation of the material. So if we take a, a quantum dot that looks like this and we cap it with something, and in this case you can think about it as being bromine or iodine, then uh, we can prevent shifts in the UV vis spectrum which are due to oxidation. Here we have bromine uh, capped lead sulfide and after about five weeks you can see that there's basically no shift at all and that's because of the bromine capping. So um, this is one way that in this material type 
we are able to stabilize the quantum dots against oxidation and make them last so our cells last for a little bit longer. Okay, so film fabrication. So when we're making these films, there's, um, it's a little bit different from doing this by sputtering. We have, uh, we spin coat a layer of nanoparticles. And when we spin coat them down, they have their long chain ligands intact. And this is uh, bad for two reasons. We have then a very insulating film because these ligands are very insulating and they don't stick very well to our substrates. So we have to perform a step called linking. And what this does is we, we introduce a, another chemical, another molecule into the, the film, which binds more strongly to the, to the nanoparticles than the previous one. And so it displaces these previous nanoparticles and we can wash them away. But again, the miraculous thing about this is that on this linking step, you can ensure that your already shape and mono dispersed size uh, nanoparticles are now spaced by a controllable amount in general. So you have literally one, two, three, you know, four atoms in between each quantum dot. And this is really key for transport. Uh, also, people have started to use iodine directly uh, to link their nanoparticles. And with iodine, you not only get oxidation protection, but you also get um, spacing between your nanoparticles, which is only two atoms. So that is quite close. So you have this quantum confinement effect. The confinement effect is, is uh, maintained using the capping, but also you're able to get these nanoparticles very, very close together. So your transport in your film ends up being re reasonably good. So can we make cells from this material? Yes, we can. We can do it here. So uh, here's some IV curves done by Lin Yuan, who's sitting in the audience. He's been our cell superhero. <laughs> He's been taking care of this, really pushing this forward along with Xu Zhuan. And uh, we were able to get uh, 2.08% <laughs> efficiency from this cell type. And you might ask, is this just your best cell? Did you get lucky? No, the, the cell type, this, uh, in the cell type, we've been able to reproduce this result. So in May, when that cell was made, we were at about 2.1% and now we've climbed up about a half a percent or 0.4% there onto the next one. You can see that there are many places on each cell where uh, the efficiency is measurable. So these are working cells. Uh, we'd like for them to approach this 9.9% world record efficiency clearly, and we're getting there. So we're, we're doing our best <laughs> to, uh, to get further. And so what are the things that need to be done in order to do that? Uh, basic film fabrication in this material system, I think, is really important. So you need to make sure that you have good continuity in your films. Uh, from Solution processing, you always may ha have to deal with, especially in your whole blocking layer, this ZNO or TiO2, you have to worry about surface tension. So when this thing is drying, it has the potential to contract on itself or has the potential to, uh, to crack uh, during a heating process. So uh, there are ways around that. Layer by layer deposition helps a lot. Um, film density is also an issue, especially for the nanoparticles, as you know. Uh, you, know you need to get these nanoparticles very close together in order for there to be good transport through your film. We'd like to go to wide areas. I know uh, one of our team members is particularly interested in that. And after that, if we can get up towards 5%, then it makes sense to start playing with more advanced things that we can do, such as plasmonics or light trapping and hydrophilic ligands, all these other fancy things, because at 5%, you're in a position to say, this variable, when we change this, it actually affected the efficiency rather than um, worrying about, oh, this was just a bad batch of cells. Okay, so that's everything that I want to say about colloidal quantum dots today. So we're, we're getting there uh, with that. It's, it's very promising. We're definitely on an upward trend. Uh, Catechol surface functionalized TiO2 nanoparticles is the next thing I want to talk about. And this is done with people in material science. And here's a picture of the structure. So this red and white blob in the middle here is a TiO2 nanoparticle and the way this uh, material is, is formed is we use this very strongly 
chelating molecule to attach to the surface. And chelating means that it's aggressive. It, it goes in on the surface and it attacks it very strongly. And when this happens, we, we see a band gap narrowing effect. So all of the previous work in lead sulfide, lead selenide nanoparticles was about involving uh, band gap widening. You take a material, you make it small, and the band gap gets wider. This is an opportunity to make, take a wide band gap material and make the band gap smaller. So if you're able to incorporate both of these effects, you might have a very tunable material. And that's part of the motivation. So um, this is basically what it looks like. And so the, the reason why the, uh, the, the science has been attributed to why the band gap gets narrowed by these surface molecules is that there ends up being a strong surface dipole between the titania and the molecule, the ligand that's on the surface. What happens is a, an electron goes from the ligand down to the titania, and a hole jumps up onto the, um, the ligand. And that's kind of stuck there. So it ends up producing the strong surface dipole, which uh, has the potential to lower the band gap of the material. And I was curious to see if I could reproduce this with some modeling. So I did a little bit of that. But I just wanted to say before I show you the modeling that this is kind of a general uh, problem. If you have strong surface dipoles in your material, then you can end up with saturation of your, of your band gap uh, as you go to small sizes. And this has been shown, Kane uh, shown this, showed this in 1996. Here's the experimental trend for, the, um, for small nanoparticles. This band gap tends to rise and then sort of saturate, whereas the uh, theoretical prediction looks more like this. It's much steeper. And so you can imagine this having something to do with the surface dipole. So the fact that the surface ends up dominating the physics of the nanoparticle. So what I did was I wrote down a type binding model where the electron states are broken down into hydrogen-like orbitals. Look something like this. They have a potential energy and a kinetic energy, which is a function of K, the, the momentum or the wave number in the material. And if you sum these things up in a big matrix and you use the right coefficients and diagonalize it as a function of K, you can make band structure plots. And if you apply electric fields to these hydrogenic orbitals, there are ways, uh, established theory telling you uh, how to do that, then what you notice is that there are band splittings and increased band curvature as a result of the surface dipole. So if you have a material that has a band gap and you have a conduction band and you apply a strong electric field to that band, what you see are the splittings. And so one state will go up, one state will go down. And the state that goes down goes into the band gap, you end up with some narrowing. In also, you have some curvature. So if you have a super lattice of these uh, nanoparticles, you can have transport, you can have curvature in your bands. And when you have a strong surface dipole, that curvature increases. So you can also see narrowing of the band gap as a result of not having a flat band. Instead, you have a curved band. And the same thing happens in the valence band. So this seems like a reasonable explanation. And indeed, if you diagonalize this matrix enough times and have a look at the band gap, then you can see that as the electric field strength at the surface increases, the band gap tends to tail off. Bless you. <laughs> so we have this uh, surface dipole sitting over here. And uh, as the electric field strength that I can control because this is modeling uh, increases, we have the band gap, measurable band gap coming down. I did this for a number of different sizes of uh, nanoparticles, and the trend is the same for all of them. So as a result of this, I, I initially wanted to try this material uh, as, a, as a potential n-type material for nanoparticle solar cells. But I believe that transport out of this material is going to be very challenging because as this, this defect state may be very strongly bound at the surface. So what would be potentially more feasible is to try a photocatalyst approach because catalytic reactions happen at the surface. Here you have a surface state with a strong dipole and a, maybe a, 
a 2 EV band gap. So you have the opportunity to apply this in uh, as a photocatalyst for splitting water. So here's a picture of the unfunctionalized material without the ligand on the surface, and here's a picture of the ligand functionalized. And what I don't, don't have here is, uh, to make it exceptionally convincing, is uh, a picture of the ligand in solution on its own, because maybe it's red, <laughs> right? But if you'll take my word for it, it's not. It's clear, water clear, uh, and when you mix these two things, you end up with this uh, strong color for small nanoparticles with large surface coverage of the ligand. So you can imagine trying out the splitting, and uh, we were in the process of doing that when material science decided to <coughs> build a new building. So when the, uh, the setup over there is back running again, we will uh, get this moving forward. And uh, hopefully uh, the next time I speak to you, I'll be able to give you some results of the photocatalytic measurements. So now changing gears a great deal again, I'd like to talk to you about bioenergy and a little bit uh, about net negative bio carbon bioenergy systems. And this is a very touchy-feely topic because it's a, it's a method by which we can potentially tailor the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere without compromising energy generation. So, yeah, if we can do that, that would be potentially a great thing. And this came about as a result of a call from the GSEP project, uh, which came through from Stanford. And what they realized is that through bioenergy, you can potentially uh, make uh, an industrial system which, where you take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and you put it into the ground and still make power. And this type of application is predicted to be very important for stabilizing or reducing the carbon dioxide uh, content of the atmosphere. So how is this? The central to this uh, application is a particular organism, feedstock organism. In this case, it's called cocolithophoric algae, which is a long word for saying an algae that produces shells, like a seashell. And that seashell is calcium carbonate. The algae have long been uh, studied for their lipid contents as a means to make biodiesel. So these uh, organisms are a potential feedstock for bioenergy in general, but the ones that produce calcium carbonate also sequester carbon in the form of limestone, basically. It's a mineral potential to lock up that carbon on geological timescales. So, yeah, here's a picture of the organism. These scales are the calcium carbonate, and inside you've got all the good stuff, all the food. So, with bioenergy, it's very nice to be able to take biomimetic concepts. So we can take an example from nature and try to improve on it, try to increase the rates of, uh, of sequestration, which is happening, or uh, energy liberation. And one thing that I do want to say, actually, is, is about the, um, the coccolithophoric algae. In the open ocean, these organisms are responsible for a quarter of the carbon sequestration that occurs naturally every year. So they're already a powerhouse for sequestering carbon and cleaning up the mess that we're kind of making. So, um, so this is a, a, a promising organism to capitalize on, on uh, carbon sequestration and making net negative bioenergy systems. So. In this case, in the natural world, we know that we have stratification. Up here in the, on the surface, we have photosynthesis. This is a yeah, drawing I made all by myself. And uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, up here, we have photosynthesis. And when these things die, they fall down into anaerobic uh, regions where these uh, other microorganisms called methanogens live. And these methanogens can produce biogas. And biogas is uh, something which is industrial relevant already. There are plenty of places producing biogas. Here in Sydney, we have a uh, food to biogas waste processing facility. And uh, that's what they do. They take food waste and they turn it into biogas. So that biogas can percolate back up to the surface. And in fact, marshes and wetlands, mangroves, these are large sources of biogenic methane which is also a, a strong greenhouse gas. So it, we're aware that this is a problem, actually. And if we're able to take that problem and somehow turn it into an industrial solution, then 
that's a, an interesting way to go potentially. So here's the system. I'm, I need to update this drawing, but it serves to show the basic idea. We can have algae or some kind of photosynthesis, photosynthesizing microorganism on top of on top of, on a top layer where they can see the sun, and down below we have methanogens. We take the biogas and we burn it and we re recycle the CO2 back into the system. And carbon sequestration or uh, carbon capture and storage on coal-fired power plants, they already do things like this where they potentially have long arrays of winding tubes where they pump the CO2 back through algae or some other photosynthesizing microorganism and try to capture it that way. So what do we need in order to make this work? Well, we need oxygen and light tolerant methanogen, a methanogenic community. We need microorganisms that can handle light and, and oxygen. And this is uh, a bit of a challenge because these microorganisms despise oxygen. They, it, it's a poison for them. So we need to make sure that they're separated as they are in nature. Um, we also need photosynthetic microbes with high growth rates, algae, and uh, other cyanobacteria type species. They have some of the highest photosynthesizing uh, efficiencies on the, on the planet. So you can't do much better. If you want to go bioenergy, you can't do better than 4% in algae um, light to biomass efficiency. And we need those microorganisms to also have a high CO2 tolerance. This is generally not a problem. People have already done a lot of work uh, studying that. So we know that up to 50-60% CO2, these uh, photosynthesizing microorganisms will continue to grow. So we can measure the growth rates and our growth rates that we can measure are typical. So in the lab we are getting standard growth rates which compare well with the literature. Uh, in terms of oxygen and light dependencies, actually we're doing pretty well. The Methanogenic community that we source is actually right from my doorstep. I, I walk out, I walk down to Merber Beach, and I can scoop some sand out of this, the ocean and take it back to the lab and culture it. And I have methanogens which have this oxygen tolerance. And that is, to me again, one of these miraculous things that, uh, that we've uh, come across during my participation in this project. And here, are the different CO2 contents that we've exposed the methanogens to um, and the, the cyanobacteria as well. So, and what you see is that the methane production is within air because these are biosystems, these are not resistors, these are not electrical systems. So within air, these are all the same effectively. So all of these curves basically produce the same amount of methane no matter whether we have 30% CO2 in the atmosphere or 100%. So that's encouraging. That, that says to us that these methanogens are quite air tolerant, oxygen tolerant. And there are reasons for that which I, I'm going to um, by bypass today. We also discovered that ambient light, they're tolerant to ambient light, but not very tolerant to light fluxes that are higher than that. So this is also good because we'd like the system to be passive. So we'd like to be able to put it outside in the sun or shade, it doesn't really matter, and it still uh, continues to cycle over as a little ecosystem with a net product of calcium carbonate and methane. And we can make methane from our coccolithophoric algae, the, the ones that make calcium carbonate. All of these things are currently in pieces, so we've done this piecewise. We have these experiments running and we have yet to put them all together. And hopefully this year will be uh, the end of a design phase where we can try to put together an integrated system and then get this thing cycling over and experiment on the combined system with a little bit more um, rigor. And that's it for bioenergy. So now I'd like to move on to uh, sulfur halide material source solution processable solar cells. So as I mentioned in the abstract, this is coming full circle. We're back now to solar cells and solution processable solar cells at that. So sulfur halide, some of the motivations. These materials have the potential to be ferroelectric. What does that mean? That means that the materials have a high polarizability and we have little dipoles in the material which are forced to be aligned with each other. And so there are domain walls as well, just like a magnet. We can have some of these guys out of alignment 
but they're either aligned or anti-aligned, depending on whether you're ferro ferroelectric or anti-ferroelectric. And this high polarizability or high permittivity is a potential way to increase screening in the material. And the screening is what I want to talk about today. So when we make solar cells, the first thing we would like to do with our material is get rid of any problems. So, and this certainly is a lot easier if we can anneal a low temperature, low melting point material at 100 degrees C rather than 1000 degrees C. So uh, in many cases, these solution process materials have lower melting points. We're in fact limited to lower melting points because in the chem lab we can only go up to two or three hundred degrees in our, in our solvents. So after we try to remove any defects, maybe get any point defects to migrate to a surface, uh, after that passivation, any defects which end up staying in the material, anything that we don't want in there anymore, we try to mask that. And with our colloidal quantum dot solar cells, we mask that with halides on the surface. With silicon, we like to use hydrogen. And um, that's our secondary approach. And after that, we really have to start relying on the material to do some of the work for us. And that certainly is easier if we have a material that has some way of shifting charge such that it can camouflage any further problems in the material. And this is what I'm calling screening. So free charge screening is well understood. You have some free charge in the metal, for example, or a degenerately doped semiconductor, and it can move around and it can find defects and it can passivate them. In a situation where you don't have that much um, free charge, you have to rely on either the polarizability of the atoms to do the work for you, so you can have shifts in the electron density around each atom towards something that you want to screen. So if this has a charge, this can pull the charge on other atoms if it is free enough to do so, uh, to move. And then you can end up with the electric field the extent of the electric field from whatever this problem is being limited in the material so that other uh, charge carriers don't see it. And deformations is another way to do this. Potentially you can have these things getting passivated and then maybe at, at grain boundaries for example this is something where this can be a, an advantage. So in ferroelectrics uh, this has been discussed actually by the group in Bath Potentially, you can have segregation of charge carriers to domain walls in the ferroelectric. And this potentially means that these negatively charged atoms, uh, sorry, uh, charge carriers are going to move through along this domain wall here, whereas the other ones are forced to move along other domain walls. And what I'm calling down here, just loosely termed a paraelectric, if you had another type of material where the, um, the polarized polarizable domains were very free to rotate, then you could again have a screening type effect where, where these positively charged carriers are sitting in some um, pedestal basically and the, the uh, negatively charged carriers are sitting in some valley and they are separated by some potential difference which is dynamic in the material. So it moves. As these charge carriers are moving, the potential difference also moves and helps to screen their interaction. So sulfur halides have the potential to make these little domain structures. And there's then the potential that this would increase screening in the material. So this is the structure. We have, uh, they make little nanowires naturally. And the nanowires look like this. And when the nanowires coalesce, they become a crystal, which has this kind of shape. It has an orthorhombic structure. And this has been detailed by Keller. And so I've made some of these materials. And our XRD so far is not particularly convincing. But it has peaks in the right places, just the peaks are very small. And we're not sure exactly why at this moment. This is fresh off the, I, mean, I made these two weeks ago. So. Um, It may be that we need to anneal them at a slightly higher temperature, we need to fabricate them at a slightly higher temperature, or uh, it may be that they're just not dry. So we have incalculation of uh, the solvent still in the, uh, in the unit cell. And this is 
MOS uh, 2 does the same thing if it's not dry. So just out of interest sake, we have here's the raw materials and here's what happens after you do the synthesis. So um, you can see that there's a dramatic change. We end up with a gel of nanowires and you can make antimony sulfoiodide or the seleno selenoiodide. And the selenoiodide has a slightly more lower band gap and so it's a little bit closer to what the optimal one is for solar energy conversion. And the other thing that I want to mention on the slide is just that this process can happen in air. So this is a, an air stable material. Here's some TEM. So you can see that we have these nanowires, they're about maybe 20 to 50 nanometers in diameter, and they like to coalesce into bigger nanowires. And if you squint at this, yeah, the next one's a little bit better, you can see fringes. So we should have some crystallinity in our nanowires. This is what's expected. And here you can see a full nanowire. So you can see they're quite long. The aspect ratio is quite high. We have uh, maybe over a micron in length for yeah, 20 to 50 nanometers in diameter. So can we make thin films from this material? We can. The iodine on the surface is quite sticky. So when we spin coat these things, the, the material definitely coats the surface. But in order to make a good film, I've made these intentionally small, <laughs> uh, we're probably, I'm probably going to have to find a way to suspend the nanoparticles a little bit better. In our nanomaterial uh, thin films, the, the nanoparticle solar cells that we make, the colloids are extremely stable. The, the suspension is beautiful and uh, there's no settling. In this case, the agglomeration is quite substantial. So we end up with these big blobs going down on the surface rather than a nice even coating everywhere. In order to make solar cells from this material, we would have to um, find an appropriate p-type material. These materials are typically n-type. So that means that the colloidal quantum dot solar cells that we typically make, uh, the structure needs to be inverted. I don't think this is a big problem, but in solution sometimes, you know, it's never 100% straightforward, so uh, we'll be trying to make uh, solar cells from these, and hopefully I can tell you about that next time too. So in colloidal quantum dot solar cells, we have over 2% efficiency at the moment. Um, in catechol TiO2, we're waiting for catalytic measurements. Some work in bioenergy has been presented today, and uh, I have a strong interest in these polarizable materials for... Um, for solar cells to see if we can increase the screening in these types of materials. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Uh, really interesting um, uh, whistle stop tour through those uh, wide range of projects. Um, so, uh, we've got time for the first questions. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Kevin. Um, just with the, uh, the biogas generation, mm. do you see that it could ever, uh, it, even with its sequestration properties, could it ever compete with uh, uh, straight out PV? This is, oh, yes. So um, in terms of if overall efficiency, um, probably not. Yeah, I mean, you can get 20% from a, a, a lab scale uh, photovoltaic cell and then 4% from the light to biomass efficiency, let alone what you have to do for processing after that. There's photoelectrochemical cells also which produce hydrogen, which is also a fuel. Um, so this is one thing that I was thinking about while I was making the, the presentation, you know, practicing last night, is that you really need to make sure that the methane production is high. Because if it's not high, if th that's where people are going to, industrially, that's where the interest is. Industrially, the interest is potentially not in sequestration. They don't make money from sequestration, right? So, um, so uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, natural gas is, has a lot of infrastructure already built up around it, and natural gas is mostly methane. So here's an advantage for, for pursuing biogas because all of your natural gas um, infrastructure transfers directly over to your uh, biogas production potentially. So 
there's a little bit of an advantage there. I guess what I would say is you need electricity and we're going to need all the energy we can get. <laughs> so you need electricity. That electricity is going to go for things that need electricity, like your computer or your stereo. If you need heating and you're getting it from solar energy, you're turning that into heat. You can do it efficiently, but in an energy constrained world, are you going to do that? Maybe, maybe not. And this is an, uh, an opportunity for solar fuels to fill that heating gap because going from a fuel to heat is a very efficient process. So I guess that's all the comments that I would make from your question. Yeah. Thanks very much. It was a good question. Hi. Um, you say that you have some problems with the formation with your nanowires. Yes. Is it the deposition or like the fabrication? Like, would, are you set on spin coating, or would you explore something else to, to recover? A, a very good question as well. Um, I think that the reason why we have agglomeration is largely due to the fact that we have no capping ligands in this material. So for the, maybe I can get there without a reasonable amount of time. OK, this will do. So the reason, one of the reasons why these nanoparticles only interact weakly with each other is because they have these long hydrocarbon chains, right? And for the nanowires, there are no ligands on the surface at the moment. When we do the linking step, these long chain hydrocarbons potentially become a problem rather than a solution. So if we want to make films, it's nice if we could do it without the ligand, but you also need no agglomeration. So there's some trade-off that has to happen there. The main reason, I think, is just because we have iodine on the surface. We know, and I mentioned in the talk, that iodine is very sticky. So you have this nanowire. Now I've got to go all the way back here. Yeah, OK, that'll do. So these purple ions are basically what is exposed. And that iodine is very polarizable. It can stick to itself. So in solution, I've tried to screen them using electrolytes in the solution. I've tried to add water because it's highly polar. And the net result is that the nano wires stay suspended for longer, but eventually they go and find each other. <laughs> um, so there are two options. One is if I just want to do this brute force, go more dilute and spin cast more times, or go more concentrated and make a really thick paste and somehow just mechanically spread that on the surface. Um, and so that's, that's where we are with that. I, I have to uh, put some work in before I'll know which one is the best. Yeah? OK. Uh, can you talk a bit on the electrical properties of the sulfur halides? That's a good question as well. So the sulfur halides, these antimony ones have been uh, heavily studied. To be completely honest, I've spent a lot of time trying to make the material. <laughs> so I haven't, uh, I'm not as up on the conductivity or the transport as I could be. But one of the things that you can see immediately is that there should be strong anisotropy in the material in terms of the conductivity and transport. Along the length of the nanowire, you would expect that there might be better transport than across the diameter. And this is also true uh, probably for any elastic constants that, that have to do with the material. So like any tensors uh, associated with how the material deforms and the electric fields that result from that probably are also very anisot anisot anisotropic. So in terms of total conductivity or the mobility in the material, I don't have a number for you. But there has been photo currents demonstrated from pulsed light experiments. So that's well known. Because the band gap is 1.8, so it does absorb visible light. Sorry. <laughs> I had a question on the catechol um, terminated um, titanium. Mm -hmm. um, um, you mentioned that um, that might not be a, a very appropriate material for photovoltaic, mm. so surface ca catalysis might be more appropriate. Mm. What if um, the catechols had some linking uh, molecules joining them to make a 3D network, uh, possibly of titanium uh, nanoparticles yeah. in a 3D network? Could, it be, could, could transport be achieved that way, from particle to particle? Yeah, so 
this it's almost like a PA junction. That's right. That's that's right. Mm -hmm. So one of the, what is something I did try with those was making mesoporous titania, and then functionalizing the surface everywhere. So I had this big surface area with the nanoparticles on the surface, and then I tried to put a p-type material in on top of it mm -hmm. and make a solar cell. I haven't shown those results today because the dark IV relies right on top of the light IV. So, uh, and there may be many reasons for that, some of which may have to do just with the way the cell was made. But in the, one of the pieces of literature about this material, what it says is that their experiments, and I forget exactly the technique, but they were able, at Argonne National Labs in the States, they were able to um, show that the binding actually for the hole on the ligand is actually quite shallow. So meaning that, yes, if you were able to connect this thing to other molecules, then, and those molecules were conductive, you could potentially take the charge out. That's in the very last line of their paper, so <laughs> I don't know whether they pursued it or not. That paper's from 2006 or something, so it's not, uh, I think if they, they could have succeeded or if they thought it was promising, they might have followed up. But uh, yeah, transport in these materials, it's, it's a big question mark. I've yeah. been discussing this uh, with people, and if you have enough surface coverage such that you have a high enough density of these defect states, then you might imagine hopping from defect state to defect state around the surface. And if the other surface is close enough, just like in our, our nanoparticle solar cells, you could get hopping from dot to dot by tunneling or whatever you want to call it. So that is, there's potential for transport, but I think it's, uh, I, I, photocatalytic approaches maybe makes a lot more immediate sense. So that's the first thing that we were interested in trying. I have another question. Okay. Um, the, you mentioned that the cocoa lace, uh, the algae, yeah. um, they are responsible for the quarter of the natural um, carbon dioxide sequestration. Yeah. What's responsible for the other three quarters? I don't know. Um, not us. Mm. Uh, <laughs> the other three quarters. Other things, yeah. There Maybe there are some other, uh, <laughs> other organisms. Well, production is a natural process. True. But so maybe if you start to think about reefs mm -hmm. or something like this, mm -hmm. uh, there's the potential yeah. for um, additional sequestration there. And I, I think maybe that, that statement is specific to the coccolithophore algae. Mm -hmm. So if there's other marine organisms or I, I don't know how many terrestrial organisms sequester carbon. Um, I guess there is some happening. I mean, other people, when they discuss this, there's papers in, in science about uh, sequestration and and energy generation. And what people generally have discussed is you have a plant which has more roots than stems, and you cut the stems off and you leave the roots. And then you get more carbon in the ground than you had. It's a simple approach and, and it works. If you believe that the roots actually sequester carbon, if you believe that they don't decay. And uh, that's a matter of, I guess, I guess if you publish in science, then you might have a, an opinion on this that carry some weight. But, um, but yeah, that, that, that's the other things that you can, you can immediately find in terms of net negative carbon sequestration in the literature. Uh, a lot of these terrestrial uh, applications have this simple more roots than stems, and you take the stems and you make power. Hi, Yao. One more question. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned you tried to apply some Nikon down to this solar cell. Uh, I'm wondering if you have ever tried some compounds that, that can act as uh, soft soft Lewis acid or soft Lewis base. Because you, you mentioned you tried water, but water, the hydrogen and oxygen are very hard acid and base. So the coupling between water molecule and this otherwise is probably very weak. So you mentioned you were uh, it's not going to work in a long time. Mm. So have you tried a compound that is, so, that is a softly used base or softly used acid? It's a very good question as well. Um, the, uh, when I was doing that, so there were three things that I was playing with. One was just electrolytes, and basically salt. Um, ethanolamine, which is not anywhere in this presentation, so I can't show you the structure. 
but ethanolamine is basically an amine with two carbons and then uh, an, an alcohol group, an OH group. And so that has the potential to do some soft chelation, yes. Uh, it didn't work, <laughs> uh, as far as I could tell. So it, it needs a little bit more, more work. But yes, there are other things that can potentially be tried. This was just the first brute force effort, you're right. Um, the soft Lewis acid or base is a very good suggestion because we know already that uh, these large atoms, especially like iodine, that's, they're, they're already soft, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's a good point. Oh, one more question. In your uh, colloidal quantum dots, mm. uh, do you do the linking process after you deposit the sample onto a substrate or in the solution? Uh, usually after we go onto the substrate. Okay, so in that in that case, when you replace a long ligand with a very short ligand, wouldn't you be introducing a strain and maybe possibly tear in the surface because now you have some quantum dots coming together, some going apart? Definitely. Definitely we do. So you have a volume contraction, right? Yeah. Because you're exchanging these long chain ligands. And so definitely the first few layers have big gaps. And that's why you make another layer on top. So when we do the spin coating, we tend to try to repair those. Or this is the technique. People repair those cracks by spinning another layer down and doing the linking again and then hopefully you fill in those gaps, right? So initially you get a big, some island and another island, and then you build up a layer. And actually when we look at the SEM, the SEM of the surface is extremely flat. And uh, we know by eye if we have a good film because we can see a mirror, we can see our reflection. And we think, oh God, I look good today, right? So, so you, you have this mirror image. It should look almost like it's sputtered if we have a good film. Could it be avoided if you do the uh, ligand exchange in the solution? So people have tried that, and one of the things that they see when they try to do this ligand exchange in solution is that the passivation of the material goes way down. So during the ligand exchange process, it's not quite as complete as it is in the solid state. So you spin down a layer and you do the exchange, and you end up getting more nanoparticles on the surface. Maybe it's because it's more dry, so there's less opportunity for the ligands to float away. Um, but when you do this exchange in, um, in solution, generally what has been seen is that you end up with a material that has a lower lifetime than the ones that are, that are produced from solid phase uh, ligand exchange. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, let's thank Rob again for that uh, really interesting talk. I'm sure he's available for some more discussion afterwards. Thanks very much. Thank you, guys.